Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Today on the show, we have the privilege of speaking with the great philosopher and author, Thomas Nail. And I say great, not simply because I believe Thomas is an excellent writer and interpreter of Lucretius and Marx, but also because our first encounter with Thomas occurred on the Zero Books channel earlier this year, where he offered an excellent exposition of his work in the book, Marx in Motion, which concerns the ontological dimension of Marx's work. We invited Thomas on Acid Horizon here today to talk about his three volume series on the philosophy of Lucretius. We are putting Lucretius in focus today for many reasons, one being that we believe in the importance of occasionally visiting figures in ancient philosophy. However, not only is Lucretius' work interesting and exciting, it brings to bear upon many of the theorists that we typically discuss on the show and bring into our own personal work, namely folks like Deleuze, Bataille, Schelling, and so on. But before I get into all of that, I would like to introduce Thomas to our listenership and ask him to say a few things about himself. So Thomas, I just want to say thank you for coming on the show. Could you just tell us about your work and your relationship with philosophy in general? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's great to be. Thanks for inviting me back. It's great to talk to you guys again. My relationship to philosophy in general. Uh, it's been a journey, but I'd say that I got into it through punk rock, actually. I started listening to punk music and listening closely to the lyrics, like really kind of 80s, 90s, very political, you know, punk rock, hardcore, and reading the lyrics and just trying to figure out what the hell they were talking about. I was only like 17. So you know, a lot of the references of global politics and capitalism, I was like, what are they even saying? And so that kind of sent me on a journey, both through political activism and to political theory. And so that was how I got into that and the classes that I started taking and through graduate school sort of got into ecofeminism, environmental philosophy, and just anarchism in general, green anarchy. And I mean, yeah, that's the trajectory of how I got into philosophy, and I won't go through my whole career after that, but that's how I got into it. And I come from the person, I guess, my guess, my general orientation is that I really do feel that philosophy matters quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And to me, the question of so what is kind of always on my mind. I mean, I am a nerd and I do love reading philosophy, but if it's not obvious to me why any of it matters, then, uh, you know, I have my limits. So I, I hope and I try to make when I do philosophy, that it's obvious to the readers why it matters. I love that. And I'm totally with you on that. One of the ways that we wanted to conduct this episode here today was to do it as a sort of primer on Lucretius. And I wanted to make it accessible for all kinds of listeners. And well, some of the folks that I'm thinking about are those people maybe just getting into philosophy and learning about figures like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, maybe even the pre-Socratics, you get some Thales, maybe a bit of Heraclitus, and maybe even Epicurus and the Stoics. All of those figures have had their day in the sun. But now we have this other figure, Lucretius, who those of us who work in philosophy, of course, have either heard of or read, but clearly they're bringing something into the conversation that's a little bit different. So could you tell us today, who is Lucretius? Why did this work stand out to you? And why did you decide to write a three-volume set of books on their work? Right. So the who is Lucretius, that's actually a fairly short answer because we don't actually have a lot of information about who he was. So I can I don't have to go into long details about his biography because we know very little about his biography. Mm. We know he was a first century BCE Roman poet. We know that he wrote this poem. This is all the writing we have from him. So we don't need to go on in his middle period, his late period. No, there's just the one book he wrote. And he wrote this book for his patron, Memmius. And Memmius was sort of connected to, he was a sort of Roman statesman. He had some kind of political office. He was also a kind of Epicurean of a sort and paid Lucretius basically to write this poem. And, you know, he wanted to write, I mean, we don't know why exactly he wanted to write, have a poet write a poem about Lucretius. That itself, I have not read anything of anybody interrogating that, but it's a good question of why Memmius even did that. Like, who is this Memmius guy? Why would he even desire that? Because one of the interesting distinctions here is that as between Epicurus and Lucretius on the question of poetry. Epicurus says, truth does not come from poetry. Poetry might sound nice, but it has nothing to do with the truth. All it can do is lead you astray. So Philodemus, a Latin Epicurean, says the same thing. This is a well-known Epicurean position against poetry as a source of knowledge. So why Memmius would have done this and why Lucretius would have been like, oh, that sounds great, and then proceeded to read all of Epicurus's books, which we've now lost. Epicurus wrote like 
30 volumes, which we have the titles for, and some very tiny bits of fragments. And so we have a sense and... And Lucretius's book kind of deals with those themes. So it's obvious that Lucretius read them. I personally got into Lucretius. He's, as you say, he's not like a big figure that if you took a survey class, he'd be on there. Maybe you'd get Epicurus if you were lucky, but you're certainly not going to get Lucretius. Even if you got Epicurus, you'd probably actually be getting a lot of Lucretius because we only have three letters, short letters written by Epicurus directly. Everything else is what other people said about him, or it's Lucretius's poem, De Rerum Natura, that people just assume is exactly what Epicurus thought. And so they'll teach that and say, we're teaching Epicurus. It's not exactly fair and it's kind of too bad, but we could talk about that. So I got into Lucretius because I was thinking about movement and motion. This came out of a political project for me. I spent a year on a scholarship working in Montreal and Toronto with the migrant justice group known as Illegal. I was thinking a lot about migration and human movement, investing in that. The books that I wrote are Figure of the Migrant and Theory of the Border as a sort of as a result of that, but it led me pretty quickly looking for an alternative way to think about movement. Since most of the theorists I had read had sort of treated migration and human movement as this kind of this anomaly that's like, yeah, sometimes people move, but basically we're taking the framework of the nation state and looking at problems, derivatives, errors, things that don't quite fit like migrants and refugees. And so I wanted to kind of tell a history about movement. And that led me to thinking, to discover in the history of philosophy that there's re that movement is often talked about, but it's almost always derivative. And to me, there was a political and ontological parallel there. You have philosophers saying politically very derogatory things about movement, like in Aristotle's politics. And you have Aristotle, same writer, saying things about the nature of reality, that there's this unmoved mover, that stasis is at the core and it pushes everything along. So I was teaching this class and I was looking for philosophers of movement, honestly. And, the, and I was just trying people out. And one of the people I tried out was Lucretius because I had read what Deleuze said about Lucretius and read Michel Serre's book. And I was like, yeah, this swerve, you know, maybe there's something, this is about movement. Even though I was very skeptical, I have to say, I went in fully skeptical because of the atoms. Mm. I thought, oh, look, <laughs> if there's atoms, there's not really movement. I mean, the atoms can move, but the atoms inside themselves, it's just like another place where identity and unity and stasis hang out inside the atom. And so I was very kind of pessimistic. And then I started teaching it and the swerve stuff was cool. And then I started kind of getting into the Latin, looking for some of the primary language and found that the word Adam was not there. And I was like, no, I just must be missing something. Like, I'm sure I'm an idiot because all the English translations use this word all over the place. I must be not understanding something. And I felt sort of stupid and got into it a bit more and realized that actually Lucretius never uses that word. And I was like, well, how could he not use that word? Everybody says he uses that word. How, how can all these people be wrong about that? And that led me to really kind of rethink Lucretius without the atoms. Now, we could go into it later. There's some other things to say about other words and why it is that people thought to use the word atom to translate these things. But it is tr true, and nobody denies it, although almost nobody ever says it, which is why it's a shock to people. No, almost no commentator, translator, or anyone ever directly comes out and says, the first thing you should know is he never uses the word Adam, but I'm going to proceed to talk about Adams because it's awkward. It's uncomfortable mm -hmm. to say it outright like that because it puts it, it just it raises this initial skepticism about the whole thing of like, wait, if he never uses the word, what is he using? And why aren't you using those words? Why are you choosing to use Adam when you could use the other words that he actually used? What are you doing here? What wool are you pulling possibly over our eyes? So anyway, all of this over the course of writing the volumes began to sort of hit me that I might be dealing with something really different than I thought, and maybe that a lot of people thought. And most importantly, one of the themes is Lucretius's connection to the poetic tradition. Another theme played down typically by Epicureans, who again, aren't interested in poetry, don't care about poetry, do not see this as a path to the truth. And Lucretius obviously did, and it's a tension, again, not often brought up, that Lucretius is fully aware of what he's doing, and he's going against the master. This, the person who's supposed to be most Epicurean is in fact himself like doing something in a deeply un-Epicurean. If Epicurus lived to see what, so fifth century BCE Epicurus, first century BC, so four to 500 years later, Lucretius, if Epicurus had lived to see what was going on, they, he would have been horrified. 
be absolutely horrified by what he had read. He'd be like, this is not what I was talking about. I can't believe you've done this. And now people like scholars are going to teach your work as if it was talking about me. No, I never said anything about a swerve. I never said anything about Adams or sorry, Luke Epicurus never said anything. We don't have any direct evidence that he said anything about a swerve. That's another error. People are always talking about Epicurus's, you know, swerve. It's just not there. We have no evidence for that other than that one commentator says that, and this is much later, this is around Lucretius' time, one commentator says that Epicurus once said swerve. But what did he say? We don't know. We have no idea what Epicurus ever said about it. We have no idea if Epicurus thought about it later on. I'm digressing. I'm going too, too far into this. I'm sure this will all come out. This is some of the nitty gritty that I like got into. I was like, what the hell is going on in this literature? What? Why is everybody, there's this such a mix up and an unreflective absorption of the two together. So I'll stop there. It was interesting hearing how you came to Lucretius because uh, I suspect for the way that I sort of first learned about him as maybe a, an important thinker that I ought to be looking at was through Louis Althusser. And I think that might be the case for many sort of recent you know, philosophers and writers and so on, is that Althusser has this really interesting period towards the end of his life, mostly in the most captured in the book, uh, Philosophy of Encounter, where very strangely for a sort of Marxist philosopher, seems to pin Lucretius as a very important philosopher for the left to be thinking about, right, in relation to history and chance and all the rest of it. So it's interesting that that doesn't appear to have been the way that you approached this, which I, whereas anyone I know who even knows who Lucretius is actually tends to be someone who's at least interested in Marxist thoughts, or even if they're not normally, they, they, they like Luke, they like Althusser, and he sort of introduced them to this. So I don't know if now is a good or bad time to, to maybe raise this, but given you've given us a bit about Althusser, sorry, that's about uh, Lucretius you know, in his own context, could you maybe say a little bit then about why more modern thinkers like like Althusser, for example, even though that wasn't necessarily your introduction, thought that he was maybe an interesting or important thinker to be looking at when, frankly, there are so many we could be reading right now. You know, we could be going back to Plato or we could be, you know, reevaluating Sartre and so on, you know, why Lucretius? Yeah, and I think the short answer to that is the swerve. That's what Althusser was looking for. And of course, I had, I, before I had read Lucretius, I did, I read, yeah, Deleuze, Serre, and Althusser, and I was like, something's going on. If these guys thought he was cool, like maybe this is worth digging in that, a right? bit more. Right, and I mean, it's not like nobody had written, there was a couple, so Keith Ansel Pearson had written on Deleuze and Lucretius. So people mm. in that world were connecting those pieces. I am sort of curious, I don't know the answer of when Althusser starts to think really seriously about Lucretius and the swerve and build and make into it an aleatory materialism, like mm -hmm. transform his idea of Marxism because of this. Like when does all, I mean, you're right, it's a later yeah. writing. So I do wonder if what exactly was in the air in Paris between Serre and Deleuze yeah. and all to Serre and who got it first and who wrote about it and who then published first on it. And I'm not really sure of how that matrix went down. And I haven't read anybody detailing that history, but I think you're right. For me, that was kind of a starting point is contemporary post-Marxist interest in the yeah. swerve. And, but I had never dug any deeper. And so I kind of came to it in my own way with a little bit of that background feeling like yeah. they vet, they kind of pre-vetted Lucretius for me a little bit. And I was like, this is going to, something worthwhile is going to come out of this. And so that kind of motivated, that motivated me. But on the political level, it wasn't really till I started making the connection with Marx where I had understood what was going on in Lucretius. And then I was like, wow, who's... This is like the way that I was reading it was really different. And it was resonant with Serre and Deleuze. But I had sort of wondered, like, why did they get into it? Like, where did they get this idea in the first place? And then actually, it was a conference. Keith Ansel Pearson was telling me, he's like, oh, yeah, Deleuze totally knew about this really early on. And here's where he says he, does, he gets into it. He gets mm -hmm. into it through Marx's dissertation. I mean, he wrote his dissertation on Epicurus and Democritus, which exactly. is the exact sort of framework for this. Exactly. So Mar so Deleuze, actually, this is before Marx's dissertation was translated into English. It was only in German and really not a very widely available thing. It was only going to be, it's only in the collected works in German. So Deleuze probably would have had to dig a little bit to pull this out. And then he puts a footnote in his book on Nietzsche. 
where he says he directly engages Marx's dissertation and Marx's reading of Lucretius. So he knew about it. He was fully aware of it. But the thing that was kind of unfortunate, actually, that this was a turning point for me realizing where Marx and Lucretius and then Deleuze diverge, actually, is that Deleuze himself states Marx gets it wrong. Like Marx gets Lucretius and the Swerve wrong because really the Swerve is about this conatus. He says there's a dynamic power inside of the matter that makes it swerve. And so when and so this is in the footnote about Deleuze is saying about Marx, he says Marx was basically wrong to have read Lucretius as a full-blown kind of just a materialist. What he read, what both Lucretius and Marx were missing was this was this like vital energy inside of the matter which was directing it in some way and this is exactly and once i read that i was like oh well that makes sense of a weird thing that deleuze says in the appendix without citing anything by the way he says in the appendix a logic of sense about lucretius it's a short essay about epicurus lucretius he says the swerve is conatus and i was like oh did i miss something is the swerve conatus because i don't remember reading that and i went back and checked the text no, Lucretius never uses the word conatus ever. It's just not in the text. It's not a Latin word. So, but Deleuze doesn't cite anything. He just throws that out there and <laughs> says, oh, it was conatus. And you're like, actually, Deleuze, that was Spinoza. And what you're doing is you're reading conatus, conatus back into Lucretius in order to explain something which you believe to be wrong, but you're going to do it in a very monstrous, clever way that you always do by taking Spinoza and sticking him inside whoever it is that you're reading and then transforming that person from the inside into a little Spinoza. And that's what he's done, but it's just not there in the text. And that's fine to lose his own project, but I think it is important to note that these are divergent, not entirely, of course, but there is a point at which Deleuze, Marx, and Lucretius break. And that point is Marx's dissertation. And this to me is worth looking. And then I was like, oh, I need to like really read Marx's dissertation on this. I will say I am very happy for Deleuze to like insert Spinoza into yeah. other philosophers. <laughs> very okay with that. But also probably worth at this point for listeners who don't know, again, like Lucretius. Could you give us like a TLDR, the swerve? What's Lucretius on about here? Because this is what interests Althusser. It's what interests so many sort of Marxist or otherwise sort of left wing left sort of thinkers in, in Lucretius. What is the swerve? What's Lucretius on about? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that the swerve is probably the most important concept in the history of Western philosophy. Mm -hmm. I'll just throw that out there. That's my two cents about it. I think this concept is really important. I do think, however, like many things, there are really different interpretations of what the swerve is. I'm going to give you mine. I think it's very much based in the text. I will give you the Latin words and lines, and it's all in the book to see exactly where this is being pulled from. I'm not trying to paraphrase. I mean, I kind of have to paraphrase at the moment, but I'm not diverging in this point too widely from my, what I think is completely there in the text. Okay, what is the swerve? Lucretius says that matter is always moving. It never stops moving. We can talk about the words he uses for matter later, but for now, we'll just call it matter. Matter is always moving. And he says that it's not caused by anything else. The movement of matter just moves without any external, there's no God to like pull all the strings and move the matter. There's no unmoved mover. And when the matter moves, it swerves. Um, and he uses the Latin word solarent. Uh, and this word means like habitually or accustomed to. So it's not that the, because sometimes when you hear people tell the story about the swerve and they'll say, once upon a time, there were atoms falling in a void and then one of them swerved. And I mean, although that sounds ridiculous and it's completely unsubstantiated in the text, this is literally what Badu says about the swerve. This is the story that Badu tells. It's clear that Badu has not looked very carefully at the Latin text and who even knows what translations he's reading. But he, but that's the story that Badu tells because it's common. That's what everybody says. Oh, there are atoms falling. There's atoms. They're falling through a void. And then one swerves. That's not what Lucretius says. Lucretius says the matter has always been swerving. Now, what is the swerve of matter? It's not caused, and Lucretius is very clear on this, it's not caused by anything. The swerve is not the effect of any other thing. Like there's nothing like, you know, things are hitting each other, but there's no cause that's external to the, to the swerve. The other, so that's one thing, no external cause. And you could see that this is like already very upsetting to the Western tradition. That there's no cause of the movement of matter. And that kind of just kicks out. To me, that's one of its most important features is the eschewing of causality in, in, in all of its metaphysical baggage. The second thing is that Lucretius says, when matter swerves, as it's always swerving, it's in the habit of it, it swerves, he says, in certo tempore, in certisque locis. 
And this means indeterminate time and indeterminate space. Now, this is a very mysterious kind of passage because what kicks out another thing that readers in the Western tradition and philosophers often want, which is they want to know when and where something happens. Because if you're not talking about a when and where, what are we supposed to even make and do with this? Like it's almost, it, the accusation historically from the ancients, Cicero, Plutarch, up through moderns, you know, who were very skeptical, even if they were sympathetic in the modern tradition, they'd be like, yeah, Lucretius is great with all the atoms, but this swerve business and the lack of God business, let's just like, when he says swerve, we'll just interpret that as human freedom. And when he says there's no external cause, we'll just say he just didn't know God yet. So we'll put God in there. So they be, they rebuild in human freedom and then they put back in God. And at that point, like they've basically restabilized this very unstable character in the Western tradition. And then we read it, then people often read it in this way. And people believe still that, you know, Lucretia says there's gods. And in book five, he's very clear that gods just, it's an idea that humans had from dreams when they were evolving in history, humans had dreams, and then they started to imagine that there were gods, and they just kind of got in the habit of thinking about it in this way. And Lucretius is like, yeah, that's totally fine. The gods are cool as long as we know that the gods are just naturalistic phenomena. Aphrodite just is the laughing ocean. That she just, she, the Aphros, that word foam in Greek, it just means foam on the ocean. She's the shoreline. That's all, you know, and she's this idea of sh of creativity and of love that we can see happening at the shoreline when two bodies, three really air, water, and earth meet each other and mingle together into a bubble, love. But it's a very naturalistic kind of love. And that was Lucretius thinks the first ideas of gods were just naturalistic. And then people get carried away and start thinking that the gods are transcendent. And on this point, he's very clear. Another crazy thing in the literature, people use the word intermundia to describe where the gods live in Lucretius. But the thing is, intermundia is a Latin word, but it does not appear in the text. Uh, again, another weird word that just does not uh, appear in the text. And then people use it to talk about Epicurus, which is also wrong because he was writing in Greek. So it's never a word that Epicurus uses either. He has a Greek word that means between worlds. But the idea is that the gods are somehow outside the world. Lucretius never says that. That's Epicurus. That's totally Epicurus. But then people project Epicurus onto Lucretius and then project Lucretius onto Epicurus. And it's quite a mess, honestly. And my feeling is that most of the scholarship hasn't really seriously dealt with all the messiness of that, of wh what's being projected on who and where and the conflation of Greek and Latin terms. I mean, maybe you don't care about all that stuff, but it does affect popular summaries like Badu's of like atoms falling in a void. There's no atoms falling in a void. Lucretius says that he says, if though, this is exactly what he says. So he says, if there were constantly habitually swerving matter, then there would only be atoms falling. He doesn't say atoms, but he says there'll only be matter falling through the void. It's a counterfactual. He never posits the fall of matter through a void. It's a counterfactual example of if we didn't have a swerve, then that's what we would get. He doesn't say first matter is falling through a void and then it swerves. He says it's always swerving. It always has been. It always will be. It never stops. Marx gets very close to this. I have a story about this because I took a seminar that was pretty Lucretius heavy this final semester here. And my professor walked up to the whiteboard and he said, I know some of you like this popular idea of Lucretius. He drew three lines on the board. He's like, this is a laminal flow. And then one of them <laughs> just shifts over. And he's like, this is not <laughs> what Lucretius is up to. It's like the condition of possibility for even anything that we're discussing is that swerve. The swerve is not an event that is posited on a continuum. I find that to be really funny, but it also speaks to a broader issue here, which is like, and Deleuze, I think, gets close to talking about this sometimes when he speaks of like minor sciences, these like other things that exist outside of like royal discourse. It almost feels as though in order to get to Lucretius, Epicurus, Democritus, one has to navigate a history of denunciation. Right. Like, for example, Clement of Alexandria famously reinterpreting Paul to mean, you know, the false teachers to be specifically the Epicureans or whether it be everyone in the history of philosophy saying it's Epicurus who destroys the entire corpus of Democritus. And it's through only through working with the absolute failure of Epicurus that we can even get an idea of Democritus. And then, of course, we have Marx's 
famous uh, dissertation where it's an attempt to sort of problematize that. It feels as though your book, or at least a certain element of the way in which you summarize your project in the introduction to your third volume, is an attempt to posit Lucretius within that and problematize the way in which we've flattened Lucretius to a sort of almost singular pseudo epicurean discourse and it and i feel like it it participates in sort of a long history of what we could call like a kind of not necessarily like a counter discourse but like a sort of a trail that that can only be found through opposition and through denunciation so i find it's really funny where throughout the history of philosophy what we find is little footnotes to this sort of tenor or this note throughout this sort of historical delineation, but it's always an attempt at a corrective, <laughs> whether it be like a footnote in Nietzsche where Canonis appears or et cetera. It almost feels as though it, it almost is through the history of correction that we've somehow reached the possibility to even enunciate what we find in Lucretius. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is, you know, I realized when I started doing this, it would probably appeal to some people interested in that kind of that monstrous side that we want that, you know, that is sort of has to be structurally denied. Some people would find that very interesting. Be like, well, there's this weird monstrous stuff that's going on inside of Lucretius. These, all these weird errors that kind of don't make sense within the prevailing paradigm. And then I knew there would be pushback from basically classical scholars who have really invested in this idea and anybody invested in the idea of Adam's it's a good marker, basically, Marx's dissertation for what the future holds for this kind of reading. And I think, you know, Sarah's in this way, but like, again, it's not like Sarah's book is, you know, that like classic scholars seriously, some of them do, but most don't really take Michel Serre very seriously. And almost all of them don't take Marx seriously. Marx's reading of Lucretius is seen as basically bonkers and of Epicurus is like, this, I mean, so one part of it is true that Democritus and Epicurus are different, and Marx was one of the first people to identify that, but the reading Marx gives of Epicurus is completely, it's, I mean, it's kind of, it's a little unhinged, honestly. It's brilliant. I think he's right, but he has to really do some damage to make it happen, and one of that is he imports kind of Hegelian dialectics. He's just, you can see from his, you know, the collected works, he's just been reading Hegel's philosophy of nature. He's been thinking about those, you know, the lecture notes, and he's been thinking about nature. And he takes that idea of a dialectics inside of nature, a material dialectics, which it's different than Hegel's natural dialectics for many reasons we get into. But he takes that and then he turns it on Epicurus. And he says, you know what? And Epic Epicurus talks about atoms. There's these different features. And Mark's like, okay, there's atoms, there's a fall, there's a swerve there's a void, and then there's the repulsion between all the atoms. So he breaks it down into these elements. And then he says, each of these elements is just a dialectical stage. It's all part of a continuous process, which these are only dialectical moments of. Each of them, if you looked at them on their own, would be total abstractions, and we should reject that idea. And you're like, wait a second, because that, I mean, Epicurus wasn't writing, even the letters we have, there is no hint that these are stages of a dialectic, okay? That is just not an Epicurus. But this is the way Marx reads it. He's like, oh, they're just stages. And so Marx himself in his reading of Epicurus is extremely heterodox. I don't know anybody, I haven't read a single thing where a classic scholar was like, this is a very interesting reading of Epicurus. No, they're not They don't. They're not gonna go read Marx's dissertation. Marxists don't even read Marx's dissertation hardly. They're, and the classic scholars aren't gonna go back to that. But what's really interesting is Marx really, he does have to do a little bit of dance to pull it off. But what he gets is his philosophy. He gets a he gets a materialist philosophy of nature. He gets a materialist dialectic against the Hegelian idealist dialectic. And he gets communism, the possibility of communism and true material, historical, natural, and human freedom all together. Marx gets everything from that move, even though he has to you know, as you say, sort of denounce a certain version of Epicurus yeah. that other people have got wrong. He runs with it and you get a really amazing philosophy. Um, and there's sort of this moment, like there's this strange moment where the opposition on like relative necessity as determinism and then the direct antipode of that, that Epicurus plays is, and I think the one line that I'll always remember from the dissertation, or at least the translation that I read, is the boundless nonchalance line about Epicurus. But there, there are some 
analyses of that dissertation that says like this is very much Marx like playing for Bruno Bauer like putting on like putting almost like Greek masks theatrical masks on each of these figures for both on the one side you know Kant and then on the other Hegel right where Democritus embodies a kind of bad infinity for dialectics as a science it's a good way to, to pivot I guess because yeah as you were saying uh, well, Marx's dissertation, it's, I don't think it's even based off the nature philosophy, the philosophy of nature from the encyclopedia. I think it's based off of the deduction of quantity in the Hegel's science of logic. Because there's a giant addition to that, where Hegel talks about how what Epicurus has over Democritus is that contradiction, he adds motion into the atoms, but at the end of the day, we're going to get a unified one. And Marx carries on that tradition of the atomisms. And it seems, Thomas, that with your reading of Luc Lucretia, so you're trying to it's quite a subtractive move. You're subtracting the unity of these atoms because there's a kernel in there of discreteness. This all goes back to how you read Lucretius's theory of matter, which is that it's all yeah, it's, it's all motion all the time. It's all dynamic, seemingly to be a collection of dynamic and repelling and contracting forces, which in Marx in motion through Marx, you identify with the atom and the void. So it's always still moving even if it isn't the unified one. But I was going to ask if you could expand a little bit on this theory of matter because it seems to be one that presents a materialist history of things but not in terms of laws of matter that we would get posited from position of a, you know, a subject like Kant a certain condition of experience but instead looks at the conditions of experience as they are always moving so where laws of matter or laws of nature because they'll be ultimately I guess the same thing for Lucretius will ultimately be laws of emergence tendencies I said habitual kinds of material moves and material swerves of course Habit, I guess, is the swerve. This is where you can link up to Deleuze and all that. I was going to ask something about how you think matter functions in the Lucretian universe, particularly in terms of the certain kinds of emergent ten most common. So you talk a lot about diffusion, dust mode. It's a very the, the Lucretian universe is very dusty. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the sort of the dynamics at the heart of I guess packets of matter or regions of matter and how that ends up with these kinds of emergent dusty universes, the history of which I guess we'll, we'll get into as the history of, of said diffusion. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's a great, it's a great question. You partially kind of answered it by, because that is the answer. Like there is no law of matter. If there is a, if there are Marxists who are like saying, oh, the deterministic laws of history are like the dialectic must go this way. It's like, no, the dialectic doesn't must anything. And you do not get any determinant, like you do not, you get any determinacy, you do not get any reduction, you do not get any necessity, hard necessity from Marx's dissertation. Why? The swerve. The swerve is always going to be indeterminate. You never know what it's going to do. So the dialectic is always open in that way, as you said. And, the, you know, one way to think about that, but it's of course not that the world is just a bunch of random stuff bouncing around. It is emergent patterns that come out of the swerve. Now, the question of how you go from indeterminate in, you know, the indeterminate time, indeterminate space, then you get movement that makes space and time and forms. So the question is, how do you get those space and time and forms out of just indeterminate movement? And Lucretius, there's so many examples that we could give, but I want to just highlight a few terms in part because they're often translated out of many English translations. Lucretius is often using words that are references to weaving and folding. So he uses these as images to help us think about how you go from swerving matter to what he calls rerum. And the rerum are just their things. They just, they're, you know, they're discrete, they're observable, they're the things of the world. Where did those come from? How do we go from not directly observable matter, the corpora, and then how does that turn into a thing? And his answer is all these various words that have to do with folding, nexus, plexus, the, uh, Amplex, like he's always talking about the way that things fold. These the matter folds over itself. It's responding to itself, and then it over time it iterates, habitually swerving into more stable entities, just like threads would weave into a textile. And so that's another image he uses is textiles. And of course, the play there he's playing with is that the poem itself, that language itself, the text itself is just like these, just like matter being woven together, words are the rhythms through which, you know, knowledge and understanding of these things happen. And it's in those patterns and that those patterns are why he's giving us a poem. And he's not just writing a treatise or an essay or a letter or something like Epicurus did. He's not writing a big book. It's not some philosophical thing. It, you know, or it is philosophical, but it's not like a classical philosophical essay. 
It's a poem. You are meant to listen to the rhythms. You're meant to hear them. And the rhythms are meant to weave sounds together into a metastable state that brings you on some path. And he often describes walking a path. You know, he says, I'm just following Venus. Like she's leading me. The muse is leading me to sing this song. And I'm going to sing this song to help lead you. And so there's this path story and you don't want to veer off the path or else you're not going to understand what's happening. But if you follow the rhythms, if you sing the hexameter, your body will sync up to these things. Your mind will sync up to them. So it's not even on a fully kind of cognitive, mentalistic, rationalistic level. The poem is meant to work on you at a material, performative level. Um, and that mirrors the rest of the universe. So the poem is meant to do what nature is already doing in the form of a poem. Does that make sense? So he's not like, here's a series of five propositions about the nature of things. When you read commentaries, that's how they treat them. They're like, proposition one, proposition two, proposition three, that was the same as Epicurus, therefore they're the same. That's like completely rejects the whole purpose of the methodology that poetry is not meant to be producing standalone propositions. It, even though there are arguments and claims being made, for example, ex nihilo, there's nothing comes out of nothing. That's a statement. You could turn it into a proposition. But as a piece of poetry, it is also a weaving of nature together into sounds, sounds that resonate with your body and brain, and then sounds that produce this thing. So you could look at it on a strictly performative level. The text is meant to work directly on you and not be reduced to a series of propositions. The short so, answer is weave, weaving and folding is how indeterminacy becomes so, something metastable. So we know where Derrida got the idea that there is nothing outside of the textile. <laughs> but, uh, Craig, sorry. No, that's fine. Thomas, this is great. I want to talk about a couple of the concepts that really struck me, namely the notion of decline, declination, dissipation that appear in Lucretius's work. And I'll start by quoting something that you wrote in that section of the introduction. You say, of course, as if this is a matter of fact, there's no real opposition between ontology and ethics. So when it comes to thinking about Lucretius' work, his metaphysics, his ontology, and his ethics, there's a few concepts that come to play, the concept of history, which we talked about a little bit, but then this notion of decline or declination, which you say that in book five and book six of this long poem that he wrote kind of takes a dark turn or an unexpected turn or maybe an unsatisfying turn in terms of what one might expect of a metaphysical theory, because it seems that Lucretius proposes this idea that everything is in a kind of terminal decline, a kind of cosmic entropy where everything falls apart. And amidst all of it, he in invokes a few concepts, this notion of abandoning the idea of salvation, but it's clear to him that this sort of confrontation with death is the way that we can achieve the kind of ataraxic experience or this experience of inner harmony or inner peace that, you know, the Stoics and Epicureans have their own way of going about. And amidst reading all of this, it was impossible. You know, you're always bringing your own figures into the work, just like Deleuze putting Spinoza in and everything. And I'm just thinking Bataille. And I tried to stop thinking about Bataille, but Lucretius goes on with this. And so I was hoping you could say, is there a resonance here between what's happening in the work of Lucretius and Bataille? Bataille uses a term in his essay, The Labyrinth, the sort of diffuse immensity of the world, that all particulars, they're abandoned to their life, their particularity in a way. And they form aggregates, you know, in the form of cities, gods, cultures, empires, and so forth, that are metastable or relatively stable, end up breaking apart. We see a bit of that here in Lucretius as well. And the fundamental thing is to realize that we all are facing down our imminent demise, that we will die someday. And for Lucretius, there is no eternal upshot. When we die, that's it, because the cosmos is on this eternal trajectory towards either powering down or fully dissipating. Am I right in that intuition? Did Bataille have any sort of encounter with Lucretius, or did you draw any of the same connections? Because I know that you've done work on Bataille as well. Yeah, there's so much, there's so much here. So on the Bataille thing, yeah. So I wrote another book kind of alongside her that was around the same time as I wrote the third volume of the Lucretius book called The Earth. And I was really getting into Bataille and sort of tracking the history of entropy and Vernadsky, this Russian scientist who at the time, so this is like, yeah, early 20th century, Bataille was one of the few people who had read Vernadsky, who basically was describing exactly that, the relationship of the cosmos on the earth in terms of like, yeah, just energy and the way that the, the non 
earth elements influenced earth history. And Vernatsky got very excited about thinking about the earth as a kind of an evolutionary system inside of a larger cosmic one. And Bataille took that really seriously. Bataille's very first essay, I'm often shocked at how just prescient Bataille's work is. When it's not completely off the rails, it's just total genius. But one of these essays is, I don't think it's translated into English in a collection, but it's separately, but it's called A Lacour Celeste, like Celestial Bodies. And in it, he said he has these like wonderful passages of like that the whole universe it, through entropy, because he's just taking entropy seriously. I mean, entropy, as known in the 19th century, he's just like, follow that out, folks. If that's what's going on, think about human history, Earth history within the larger perspective of what's going on in the cosmos. Don't delude yourself about universal knowledge at universal goodness. Like this is all like really very regional blip in the history of the cosmos type of stuff. Why don't you look at what really is going on? And what is really going on is that the cosmos since its birth has been dying. It's just been spreading out. That's what I take to be the meaning of entropy without getting into what I believe to be metaphysical definitions that involve randomness and probability. We don't need to go to those to understand what entropy is. It's just the movement from hot to cold from concentrated to less concentrated. And that's what's going on. And the universe is headed in that direction. And there's nothing that we know of that goes the other way. It's as close to a material universal law, you know, even though it's totally emergent and it emerged in our universe, but we don't know of anything that's not doing that. But Ty says, take that seriously and realize that death is, it's a really integral part of what's going on. I mean, it is the fulfilling of the cosmic project is to die, to dissipate, to waste to squander your energy, the, and you can see it all through nature. So Theory of the Earth talks a lot about how this works on all these different scales and how important it is to, frankly, like the continuance even of the world as it could be, I suppose, but a more stable world. Anyway, that's Bataille's vision is entropy from the beginning all the way to the end. Everything's mm -hmm. dissipating. I think Bataille, it's a little ambiguous what happens at the end. In the 19th century, some people talk about heat death and the universe gets to the end and just stops. Now, we're in a kind of t speculative territory. Nobody knows for sure what will happen at the end of the universe. Will it stop and everything become static? It's pretty unlikely. In the 19th century, th that was a serious concern, like that everything will just end in stasis. After quantum physics, though, I don't think that is a sensible conclusion to come to. The universe will not die in that way because energy at the quantum level never stops moving. It does not, it, it might not necessarily reorganize into a new cosmos. There's a theory of cosmology called the big bounce that Carlo Rovelli, this phys Italian physicist has put forward. And the basic idea is that once the universe eventually unravels itself down to the smallest levels of fluctuating energy, it will eventually contract in part because having to do with the Planck scale and, you know, if everything is swallowed up by black holes, which is probably how everything will be broken down. Black holes are really good degraders. They'll break down everything, diffuse it into very small bits of energy over time. But eventually the whole universe will happen. And then that black hole will sort of like eventually dissipate and then everything will be broken down. Now, in the end, Lucretius, he's very clear that the world is going to die. Everything will die. That is the nature of things for them to die. But he never says in the end that, but don't worry, they'll be reborn again, folks. He never promises us that. And that's why I say that there's no salvation. There's no redemption. But Ty never promises us that either. He just says, you know, he doesn't speculate exactly about like heat death being like, oh, it's total static end of the world. But he doesn't say like, and then that's where it all comes back together again. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But look, this is one of the fundamental consequences, again, back to the swerve. If the swerve is true, like almost everything in the history of philosophy is wrong. It's like, it's really the swerve or everything else. Like you have to choose because if you choose the swerve, it really blows apart everything else. I think it's that like poisonous or in a good way, I suppose mm -hmm. it's that like invasive of a concept. It's so fundamental. Either we're dealing with indeterminate movements or we're not, and we're dealing with all kinds of other things. But if those indeterminate moves are true, that means that there's no guarantee of redemption, but it also means there's always the possibility of not of the new world coming. So look, it's possible that the world, that our universe will dissipate and that it will come back together again. Also that our big bang was just the explosion of another previously dead universe that had blown apart, contracted back together and exploded out the big bang. That's possible. Do we know this with any certainty? No. Is it consistent with the laws of physics? Sure, but we don't know that. And I think Lucretius is wise to end the book with an ambiguity and without giving you salvation and a promise of renewal even though he gives you the possibility of the renewal, he doesn't guarantee it because the guarantee would close the swerve off and it would say everything's swervy except 
the fact that it will definitely die and definitely be reborn the same way. That's the version that you get with Democritus, like the world, and also with Empedocles. Empedocles, the world is just expanding, expanding and contracting. There's no swerve. Once you throw the swerve in that mix, you know, you're not going to get the guarantee about, about the renewal. Lucretius concept of indeterminacy here seems very important because when you look at, for example, arguments in the free will versus determinism debate and the way that they bring in, for example, quantum mechanics, this seems to be the sort of horizon of that question right now. Because in order to have free will, for example, at least in, in the sort of binary that we've constructed in Western thought, you need to be sufficiently non-random and you need to be completely non-deterministic. And it seems that maybe something Lucretius is saying could fit that bill, but it seems important for so many other things in the theory. How are we to understand what he means by indeterminacy? How does he flesh that term out? Yeah, so this is a good question. Actually, one of my students wrote their final senior paper on this question and neuroscience, the neuroscience of free will and the philosophical question and how Lucretius can help us think about that in neuroscience, because you don't, you don't, you get lots of unexplained novelties, which we tend to call human freedom, but it doesn't mean that they're not relational. So, so, so here, back up, randomness and determinism. On one hand, randomness, this is actually, even though I do like Althusser, this is what Althusser says about this word. He says that it's random. And I, I don't agree with that. I don't think that support, I mean, he can think it, but I, it's not in Lucretius and he doesn't exactly cite anything or really go closely into the text. Epi Althusser just asserts it. But to me, an ep it, it can't be possible. It cannot possibly be random for Lucretius because Lucretius says every one of these movements comes out of the others. And if it's relational, which is to say, if it has any relation to the past, it cannot be truly purely random. Does that make sense? Because if something was truly random, it has to be independent absolutely from anything else. And Lucretius does not say that matter works like that. Actually the opposite. Marx, same thing. Dialectics means things unfold and fold in and out of each other. It's there's nothing that's isolated or separated that can be truly random. So the discourse about human freedom is often predicated on an ontological difference between humans and nature. And that's how we get to be free. Because if we were fully natural, then we couldn't be free. On the other side, determinism, I mean, that's an easy one. That's obviously out the window for Lucretius right away because there's no external cause. We'd never get to the bottom and we would never find some cause that caused things to swerve. So it's neither deterministic nor is it random. The quick answer to the human freedom question and one way to solve it is that I really don't like the question. I mean, like, I don't like the way that it's framed in the history of philosophy right. because it frames it in such a way that you'll never get out of it. That's exactly. just classical philosophers doing what they do is they frame it in such a way. If you accept the terms in the beginning, then you'll never get out of the problem because it's a poorly posed problem. So here's one way is just to like say, I'm not going to play the game and let's stop talking about human freedom. And one of the consequences from Lucretius is just radical ontological material freedom. All the universe is free. And that is one of the consequences that follows if there is no external cause. But I mean, it's there's this is not just like, you know, poetry in a vacuum here. This is contemporary physics. Like, what's outside the universe? Space? No, not empty space. It, there is no external anything outside the universe. Now, what does that mean? It means the universe itself is imminent. It means that the universe itself, its motions collectively have no external cause. The universe is a simultaneous transformation of the whole thing without any causality. Things transform together through entanglement without ever directly causing one another. So it's not a cause effect relationship. It's a global transformation of the whole with iterative patterns that evolve relationally. So what that means is that the entire universe is free. It's not determined, it's relational, it's not random either. The whole universe is like that, we're within it, we're free too. Now, of course, humanists are not going to like that one or anthropocentric philosophy be like, no, no, I want specialness for humans. Our freedom needs to be special. No, I'm sorry. You're just as free as everything else in the universe, which is to say there's no external cause on the simultaneous transformations of the universe. Great. Yeah. So I, I have a somewhat selfish question, but just like before I ask that, you know, was Craig mentioned to me about like free will and so on, this debate within philosophy. And I remember like my undergraduate education was mostly in an analytic sort of modality, right? And I remember sort of engaging with this free will debate and thinking that, and, and reading this as well, you know, to be fair, this wasn't just me, you know, come up with this, but like, if a choice between like absolute determinacy versus pure random chance, like just a, a purely sort of, well, yeah, random sort of approach to this, 
neither appears to be the kind of free will that the humanists have in mind to have anyway, right? Which did lead me to that view that you said, like the problem therefore appears to be sort of quite poorly posed, you know, pure sort of indeterminacy versus pure determinacy doesn't appear to be the right terminology in some sense for thinking through the kind of thing we mean when we talk about human free will and so on, right? Something's going wrong there in, in the framing of the question. But yeah, so I guess I have a, like a somewhat selfish question, but I really just want to hear what you have to think about this. There was a passage early on in the introduction to your third volume that we were reading through, where you were talking about the difference between Epicurus and Lucretius as two quite distinct sort of thinkers. And if you don't mind, I want to read this short passage, both for your sake and for the listener's sake as well. You write that R.V. Epicurus, quote, Lucretius, on the other hand, does not believe in any gods outside or in between worlds. The only gods are only our ideas. These ideas are wholly material and historical, like all knowledge. However, if knowledge is historical, it is, like history itself, experimental, fallible, dispositive. There is no salvation. This is the start of a strange new theory of history that is worth taking seriously, and it throws into question the entire Western, med- Western philosophical project. And I read that, and I was really interested in it, particularly because, mm-hmm. as I said earlier, my introduction to Lucretius was through Althusser, who himself was trying to trace, I'll probably mess it up, the exact phrasing was, the underground currents of the materialism of the encounter. I think I got that right. And, you know, he goes through, you know, Machiavelli, Spinoza, you know, well, from Marx, Spinoza, Machiavelli, and all the way back to Democritus and Lucretius. And there are a number of papers on Lucretius in particular. I think he was as a sort of very important figure in this sort of tradition of a kind of repressed materialism in the history of Western philosophy. And to sort of put a point on this, sorry, to bring it back to my actual question here. One of the things that strikes me is that my thesis at the moment is on this field of radical democratic theory. And the split in this is very binary in a certain sense, actually. We have a field here. It's a split of kind of what is so-called imminence or transcendence, right? And it's a split that doesn't exist just in this field. You can see this in a lot of more recent radical theory and political theory, et cetera, right? Between, I would say, as a sort of rough sort of rule of thumb, thinkers who are maybe more indebted to Hegel versus ones who are more indebted to Spinoza. Right. That's a sort of rule of thumb, just sort of generalization there that you need to dig into a little bit. But what was interesting to me was reading that passage, it appeared to me there's also it, it almost appears that there's something even earlier in something like this, because one of the things that you hasten to add is that both of them, both Epicurus and Lucretius, were after a materialism. They wanted a materialism, but one of them was interested in, as you say, salvation. Right. The but in some sense. Yes, this is our condition, but there's a sense in which we can move beyond this, be redeemed, and so on and so forth. Whereas there's this other tradition represented by Lucretius in which he just says, I'm sorry, I really can't promise you anything. Right? We just don't know. So my question would be, in relation to this history that, that Althusser traces out, and you, know, you seem to be sort of familiar with yourself, do you think there's something there about maybe a, a very early split between Picurans and Lucretius? You, talk, you talked about that earlier, right? The... Lucretius, even his mode, the mode in which he expresses this, poetry rather than, you know, formal argument. Do you think there might be something there? Or am I, am I, am I sort of, you know, going a little bit too far in my like, my guesswork? It's not too far at all. I mean, if anything, it's not mm. far enough. I mean, most of our conversation has sort of stayed at the level of, you know, the ancient world, Epicurus versus Lucretius. Yeah. I mean, there's so much to say and so many differences, lots of similarities, lots of differences. But really, I mean, I think one of the biggest turns is that is basically a transition that happens around the rise of early states, the rise of around the rise of writing. And in some of my other books, Being in Motion and Fear the Object, these are, I try to trace that history. I think the beginnings of transcendence, they have to do with the beginning. They happen around the same time as around the beginnings of states, the rise of patriarchy and the rise of writing. I mean, a million other things like units of measure. I mean, there's a whole historical shift that happens and it goes way before Epicurus, way Mm. before Democritus. What's going on in the Greek world is a version of that. And the big split in the Greek world is, and which again, because even though it comes later on than Sumer and Egypt, the rise of the Greek city-states, that happens much later, but you watch a version of the same event happen, which is 
the, the capturing of oral traditions that were never written down, oral mythologies that are then being reinterpreted, and also Egyptian and Sumer Mesopotamian knowledges that the Greeks are reading, getting a hold of, and then reinterpreting in their own way. This is the classical period and the whole of philosophy as it's properly termed in the Western tradition, going back to people like Thales or these early Greek philosophers, you can see the very earliest moments where they are. I mean, there are stages of it you can see in Egyptian and Mesopotamian philosophy, but it's never, they can never really get away from chaos. They really do try to fight it and tame it, but they never succeed in erasing it. And home, when you read Homer, you got chaos, you have indeterminacy. It's not the swerve per se, but it's a very, there is nothing like some kind of unified world. The gods are not like immortal in a transcendent way. The gods are all imminent. They can suffer pain. They live in the same world. You know what I'm saying? So the gods are players, they're actors, they're good, they're bad, they make mistakes, they get punished, they're ripped apart, whatever. They're in this world too. They just don't they just can keep on living, which is not the same as eternity in a transcendent sense. It's not the same as immateriality. And then Hesiod, it's very explicit. You start with chaos. Chaos is first. And, you know, there's night and darkness. There's a really black metal vibe going on in Hesiod. <laughs> but that's because there's a black metal vibe going on in, like, really these older mythological traditions in ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia. They were real. Like, there is a deep sort of chaotic darkness in the most positive, generative, creative kind of way that is historically gets tamed. And then the Greeks reproduce it. And one way where the European tradition like locates itself is in the beginnings of classical Greek philosophy, which is to say the first moments when those early Greek philosophers are basically saying, no, there's not chaos, folks, slow down, no chaos, there's order, logos, right? There is, you know, even people who get called process philosophers, which I don't think he actually is, but Heraclitus, everything exchanges for fire. You know, okay, like it's a very kind of monetary economic idea that like everything's equally exchangeable because it's all fire. Lucretius just straight up rejects this whole idea. That's a monism. It's a really specific fire monism. Also, like it's, it's, a, it's a totality. Like he imagines it as a totality. All those are Greek philosophers. They imagine the cosmos as a sphere. Every single one of them, it's a sphere with a center, a periphery. They basically homogenize, they totalize and centralize. They come up with a principle. They rationalize. They rail against the gods and mythology. They hate Homer and Hesiod and they strip it all down. And those are the moments where I think we get in the in this Western European tradition. There's where we see some of the earliest moments. Obviously, we could cite, you know, transitionary, very close transitionary moments of, of early kind of Edic Yahweh texts where like, you know, Tehom, the deep is still there and you wonder where it came from. And then like Yahweh just creates over the top of it. But, you know, she's still there. The chaotic waters are still there. Yahweh can't get rid of it. Anyway, the point is, yes, the question of transcendence and imminence goes way back. And I think we can locate, and it's not like arbitrary. You can find it pretty much everywhere you start seeing states write stuff down. They start to produce these like increasingly elevated sky gods. They get higher in the sky. They get less material sounding. But, and they fight against Tiamat and the dragons and all this stuff. They really do their best to destroy the serpent. But they do, But in the end, they end up with some kind of compromise where the monsters are kind of still around and the snakes are still there. Greek philosophy, nope. No monsters. No dungeons, no dragons. That's not my philosophy. I need my dungeons and dragons in there. And I think that's this. all this goes back to about that. But Got to be in. Speaking of monsters... Yeah. And the monstrousness, it seems, I mean, I really like, I always like to compare Lucretius a little bit to Schelling, particularly the idea of the idea that there's a simultaneity between unending freedom and an unending materiality, which is only of itself unending dynamics of motion. And this, while it may be historically revealed to us what we are, because we never stop moving, total freedom for Schelling, at least in the ages of the world, that book is like, it's not salvation at all. It's making the freedom of that movement something joyous and something you can flourish in this kind of quasi spinozist quasi lucretian kind of way but even so there's even though there's quite an optimism i guess in sort of lucretian freedom in that we are free we just need to know how to flourish freely or how to deal with our how to live well bring it back to the oldest philosophical question the focus at least in the third volume is on history is very much on the sort of mind down moments of lucretius but he ends with the plague of athens you write, uh, history is the plague of the world, which is a line. It's very Krieg, isn't it? You know, you can hear the blast boots coming in. I just wanted to ask you something about 
<laughs> yeah, this very this this Kriegness at the center of at the center of history. Maybe just a question about how how history functions for Lucretius, and particularly how historical challenges function to the question of a material freedom of the living, you know, insofar as they are living and moving rather than insofar as they'll be safe later on. Because I mean, history is the plague of the world. I mean, we're dealing with a few plagues right now, plagues of pestilence, plagues of climate breakdown. I mean, the earth will be fine. The earth is just moving as it's always been moving. We're, we're static, but more in the sense of stasis, you know, the Greek term for civil war rather than status, so to speak, if we want to go into the Latin there. So I do also just to sort of a round up myself, how is the history, how is real material history considered as real material by Lucretius? And how does it diffuse? How does it, why is it so bleak? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing is, I don't think it's necessarily yeah. weak, even though, like, obviously, I'm playing a little bit with the plate yeah. there and some of the connotations, but only to mess with, I think, the wider view that Lucretius was pessimistic about the world or something like that. Look, the book is all over the place. It's just as optimistic as it is pessimistic. It's just not the right words to think about what's going on in this book. It opens up with the birth of Venus. It closes with the plague at Athens. The phrase, like, history is being a plague of the world, I mean, that's because, I mean, if you th th that sounds weird because you're like, well, what is that supposed to mean? Like, how is history a plague? I mean, like, I thought history was about like progress and civilization and, you know, getting better. And that's what history is. I mean, that is the, you know, that is the dominant idea of history is that history is written by victors who kicked ass and told the story afterwards of how there is unending triumph and development in this, you know, sort of, yeah, sort of quasi Hegelian way that was just things just keep getting better until you reach like, you know, really the Prussian nation state, and then you're golden and history ends. But you know what I'm saying that if history is a plague, like that's a very not idealist way to think about what history is. So the phrase is meant to push the idea of history to be material. And what I mean by material history is just entropy. I just mean that things are spreading out. And as they spread out, they dissipate and keep spreading out and breaking down. Along the way, they'll form different composites and various different animals. And some of those who, as Nietzsche says, clever animals who invented knowledge, the universe will take a deep breath, let it out. The clever animals had to die. And that's it. Universe goes on, you know, but every now and then there's this little animal that's like, wait, I know universal knowledge. And then, you know, then they die out and then none of that's preserved. Their whole planet is destroyed. So there's this like really anxiety that like history can't be a plague. It can't just end with death. Yeah, it will. It definitely will. This is not a debatable point. History will end with death. History is in that way an entropic plague that's just disintegrating everything, including knowledge, civilizations, all of our stories about progress, development, artificial intelligence, like, oh, don't worry, we'll escape Earth and go to Mars or inhabit other planets. They're all fantasies that like, oh, but if we could just get one more out ahead, it's like, no, what? But look, you're missing the point here. Those planets will die too. Those people will buy, die too. There'll be nothing left of human knowledge, nothing left of human civilizations, all of them. And there are many of them, not much less our, whatever Western civilization, whatever that's supposed to mean. All of that stuff is doomed to death. And it doesn't necessarily mean pessimism. It just means like, it means your relationship to history as progress is just completely it's against the, it's just against the universe. Like the universe is just not doing that. So to pretend it, this is what Bataille says, like, wouldn't it be great, you know, if we could face that universe and really feel that we're, that we're part of what it's doing by dissipating our own energy. Instead, we're like fighting against it, trying to survive and trying to like download our consciousness into computers or whatever. It is a fundamental anxiety in the Western tradition that the West is so afraid of death this is not universal to humans. Not all humans have that same relationship to death, nor do they have to have this one. So this is all to say that like, when you get to the end of, it tells you a lot about who you are and what kind of reader you are if you get to the end of De Rerum Natura and how you feel about it at the end. And I'll just give one counter example, which is and that I was very much like thinking about when writing this is Deleuze says, and this is, he is not totally alone in this saying, but his is a particularly extreme version. He says, the last book six must have been completely falsified. Lucretius could not possibly have written this. He, and he's very serious. Like you might think, oh, well, that's a one-off. No, he says, I'm going to contact like, you know, the French, you know, Academy of Ancient Philosophy, and I'm going to petition them to formally 
acknowledge that book six was falsified by Christians. And those Christians wanted anybody who read De Rerum Natura to remember that if you go along with this materialist nonsense, you're going to die in the end and it's going to be a nasty plague and there's no redemption. So there. And they wanted, and like Deleuze imagines this, right? But why would Deleuze? Because this is classic, actually, it puts Deleuze actually in the camp of the very Christians who have been denouncing Lucretius in his fake biography forever. People say he drank a love potion and he went crazy and killed himself. Like, this is obviously bullshit. This is not, never happened. But like, that's the Christian story of like, don't get too into this stuff because it's all about desire and pleasure and, you know, a world of material, you know, pleasures. You're just going to go crazy and commit suicide. Okay, but Deleuze's version is not too different than that. It's like, don't buy into this like materialist stuff because there's no redemption for you in the end. Now, why would he do that? It's back to his footnote on Nietzsche and Spinoza, Canatus, a striving, optimistic vitalism that he shares with Bergson. That for Bergson, God, you know, God, even though he's pure change, it's optimistic. We, there's that God is making new things all the time, and it's a creative energy in the world. There's a lot to celebrate there, and many new materialists and new vitalists celebrate that energy alongside Deleuze. Lucretius will not give that. Um, it is not there, and book six reminds you that it's not there. And you can cherry pick all the life affirming quotes and stick in Conatus words where they're not there, and you know, put in atoms where they're not there, but there are no atoms, there is no Conatus. There's just matter that is swerving entropically to the end of the universe without redemption. And that is a very Bataillean point. And that is also just what's going on. The fact that Deleuze can't acknowledge is that acknowledge that even though Deleuze knew about thermodynamics, Deleuze knows about quantum physics. He just can't, he cannot admit that those things are right. And he's going to affirm vitalism to the very end, even if it means inserting Canadis into the text and then removing book six entirely, because it sounds too pessimistic. In the end, Lucretius is like, yeah, people who, people are like burying each other. The plague is so bad. Even the people who are good, they will die because they are good. They will take care of their dying family members. And in taking care of them, they will get the plague and die alongside their family members. That's what happens to the good people. The bad people, those people steal other people's funeral pyres so they can fulfill the demand to bury their loved ones on a pyre, even though they don't have the wood because there's no mo more wood left because everybody's dead. So steal somebody else's pyre. To do the right thing is to burn your loved one's body by stealing somebody else's. And if so you lose either way. You do the right thing by you steal some from somebody else and now they can't do the right thing. So you doing the right thing means somebody else can't. And if you do the wrong thing, which is not bearing it, then they do. And you've done the wrong thing by not burning your ancestors or, you know, burning your family. Lucretius paints like a really, it's not necessarily bleak. It's just like, if you've been alive, you know, that's just how things work. You try to do the right thing and you get fucked. Like that happens. You do the wrong thing and sometimes good things happen or sometimes bad things happen. You just don't know. You can't control those things. It's not something you're going to get like a declaration of like, here's a normative ethics for you. Do X, Y, and Z and everything will be okay. Maybe it won't. Maybe you'll do X, Y, and Z and everything will go horribly. And you'll be like, well, in theory, it should have gone. No, but there is no in theory. There's no world of in theory. There is just real life and there is real messiness of ethics. And that's that messiness of the material reality and of trying to live well. You can try to live well, but it doesn't mean you're going to get to live well. It just means you're going to try and you're going to fail. You're definitely going to fail to live well, but you're going to still try. And that's what his, that's what the plague is filled with. People trying to live well and survive and take care of each other and honor their ancestors and, you know, not working out. I mean, maybe some of them work out, but they die. I'm very they tempted now to write a book on, after I finish my next book, on my first book on Stern, I'm now going to write one on Stern and decrease it. And and the creatures called Max Emotion. Thomas, I just want to say thank you for coming uh, on. This was a brilliant conversation. I think our friendship is broken with neo vitalism, new friendship with atheological sacrifice. And <laughs> I was going to ask you to go out by saying, you know, we started this conversation talking about punk rock, you know, getting into philosophy, leftist politics. And I know there's a whole aspect of climate change that we could have gotten into. And of course, part of your book has to deal with you writing during the plague of our times. You're interested introduction or the preface rather to the book. What is a takeaway? What is a Lucretian take takeaway ethically for our generation? I mean, do we just become battalions or is there something specific to Lucretius's ethics that we can use in, in terms of thinking about how to live our lives going forward? 
Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's a great question. My answer is very minimal because I think Lucretius, to his credit, doesn't give you a lot of things of like, do this, you'll be okay. He doesn't say anything quite like that. I think it's real. I mean, Epicurus is more likely to give you some commandments. You know, he gave his followers little objects with sayings on them to help them remind themselves of like what to do. And I think you're going to get, and the answer is always like, you know, contemplate the gods and, you know, be peaceful. It's a very kind of idealist, rationalist, contemplative answer that Epicurus will always have. And you absolutely do not get that in Lucretius. For today, given the situation of the plague, and I mean, this actually does get into the question of climate change and COVID, which is that I think the thing to think about with Lucretius is one of the key principles is entropy, a materiality, to think about what it means to live. To live well means, first of all, to live. You can't live well if you're dead. You're not living well if you're dead. So how are you even going to stay alive? Which is to say, you know, avoid COVID and avoid, you know, and sort of stop climate change. These are the questions. There's not like an answer, like there's not like a normative answer. Lucretius like do X, Y, and Z and that'll stop the plague. There will be plagues. Whether there is global capitalism deforesting the world or not, which is the source of so many pandemics, you could reduce the number of plagues, but there's still going to be some pandemics and plagues. The question that... Lucretius helps us reframe things in terms of trying to live well together in a material world without universal principles, which is to say, to put politics and ethics back where they really are, which is people talking things through with each other, coming out with conclusions. That's not what's going on now. There is a very small minority of capitalists who are absolutely destroying the planet. They are the source of both COVID and climate change. We are not dealing with the situation of collective survival. The, it is a, most of the population that is suffering to varying degrees, in part because there is a kind of suicidal impulse inside capitalism. And Lucretius just puts it back into the, when he gives examples, when his most kind of ethical examples are ones where people are just kind of hanging out and making music by the river. That's not a lot to go on, but I do think that it puts ethics back to the body, back to the material world, where people have to figure it out one step at a time. And the swerve also undermines any answer that you're going to give. Like there's not going to be a normative answer because the swerve is there to remind you, you live in an unpredictable cosmos, in an unpredictable planet. So on the one hand, there's lots of negative things to say, which is to say the swerve will not allow you hierarchies, no great chain of being. It will never allow you to say X is superior absolutely and ontologically to Y. So it kicks a lot of things out, but what it brings in is very minimal. What it brings in is just you have to go carefully, step by step, working with other people. Now, you might think, well, that's like not a helpful answer because I need some real answers to stop climate change and, you know, to deal with COVID or whatever. Like, there just is no answer. It has to be people working together to figure it out because the world is unpredictable, because we have to experiment. We have to try something and we have to be open to being really wrong about it and then trying again and failing and trying again and working it out. And you just don't, you can't assume what people want. People change. The people on the planet shift and change what they want, what they think is good, what they think is bad. All that stuff shifts and changes. The only thing that you have going for you, you know, sort of, and I think this is, there's overlap with Marx's philosophy, with communism. I think it's very, it, in the same way that Marx says very little positively about communism, that's part of the point. Communism is just the metabolism of humans with one another, social metabolism, and with nature. Working experimentally because it's dialectical, it's indeterminate. We just don't know what it's going to do. And so we should act with caution, but we should also act in a playful way with other people to just not feel like we've got the answers. So in many ways, not having the answers can lead us to come back to where we really ought to be, which is without the answers, trying and trying things out with more humility, possibly.